So first, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, and Jesus is speaking. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. This is the word of God for the people of God. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit these words from our Scripture passage today sound an awful lot like the story on the news this weekend about the floodwaters consuming large areas around Jackson, Mississippi. Last weekend, five tornadoes ripped through communities in Maryland. And I'm sure that there are many of you here today who still remember not one but three hurricanes that hit our state in 2004, Charlie, Francis, and Jean. Whether we have been personally affected or just seen the kinds of things, the kind of damage that these weather events can do to other people and places, they are a reminder to us of how fragile life is. How quickly things can go from normal to chaos, no matter how carefully We attempt to construct our physical buildings that are our homes, our workplaces, our church. As a carpenter himself, Jesus knew a few things about building houses. And so this illustration about a smart carpenter and a not-so-smart carpenter, well, I'm guessing that they came out of his personal experience He'd seen the difference between houses that had been built to withstand the test of time and those put together hastily with little planning. However, just like any good preacher, Jesus surely had more on his mind when he was using this example than home construction. He knew as well as we do and as well as those people who were listening 2,000 years ago that any physical dwelling place that we construct is is finite. It will not last forever, but the spiritual dwelling place that we construct within our heart and our mind and our soul. Now that, with a good foundation, will last through this life and into eternity. It's those sacred spaces within each and every one of us that Jesus wants to help construct that wants to partner with us, and he gives some wonderful directions on how to make that happen in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's oftentimes known as the Sermon on the Mount. It is the largest group of Jesus' teaching in one place within the Gospels, and its fundamental call is to help us live an authentically faithful, God-honoring life. An authentically faithful, God-honoring 
life. And, and today, we're going to explore just some of those words of Jesus that will help us to get a handle on what that kind of life looks like. And we're going to use the letters in the word rock. So here we go, Rylan. Ready? We're going to use the letters in the word rock to help us to do it, to help us to understand better what that authentically faithful God-honoring life looks like. And so the Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5, and Jesus immediately gets to a subject that people care a lot about. Again, another good hook for a speaker is to start in a place that he knows will catch people's attention, and Jesus did just that. He starts off with a list of those who are blessed, and everybody's ears perk up. Who are the good guys? Who are the in crowd? We want to know. And Jesus' words are radical. Here are some examples. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Hmm. If that's what it means to be right, maybe it would be easier to be wrong. This message from Jesus, it's so counterintuitive on so many levels, and yet it is the beginning of what Jesus says is the rock, the foundation on which the sacred space of our faith, of our person, is built And if we choose to build our spiritual home on this foundation, then it will look very different from those who choose not to. And we know that being different can oftentimes be scary. When my daughter Anna was in kindergarten, she was excited about dressing up for Wacky Day. There was a couple of fifth graders that had been chosen to act as the principal and the vice principal, and one of their new rules for that one day is that everyone could dress as crazy as they wanted to. Well, that was pretty exciting for a kindergartner, and I'm not going to say I wasn't kind of excited too. We picked out all kinds of crazy stuff, and Anna's Nana actually took her witch's broom from her costume in October that had this really cool like silver and purple thing and they made it into a wig. And Anna got dressed for school and we laughed all the way to the car loop. But when we got there, the laughter abruptly stopped when Anna noticed a couple of kids that weren't dressed up. And she got immediately concerned, and she said, Mommy, why aren't they dressed wacky? Do I have on the wrong thing? I don't want everybody to stare at me. Although I completely understood what she was talking about, what she was feeling, it broke my heart that she'd already be worried about looking different than everyone else. She wasn't even six. And already, she was worried about not blending in because if she didn't blend in, she might be embarrassed. Couldn't she have just a few more years of not caring? (laughs) I guess not. But this propensity towards the need to fit in, wanting to gather and to be accepted in a group of like people, this is just a part of who we are as human beings. And it starts early. Now, fortunately, this particular story does have a happy ending because as we continue to go around the loop, thank goodness, there was a safety patrol that had on a bright pink wig and cat whiskers drawn on her face. Whew. 
But as I watched my little kindergartner at that time get out of the van, I realized that this was only the beginning of a very long road. It's not easy to be different. It's not easy to be a follower of Jesus whose radical teachings make him stick out like a sore thumb in his day and in our day. Teachings like loving your enemy, praying for those who persecute you, choices of friends like fishermen and tax collectors and women, holding up values like peacemaking, mercy, and humility in the midst of a society that said might is right and pride is power. The more things change, the more they stay the same. These are things that we have struggled with throughout our human history, but as people of faith, we must set aside our fear and instead embrace that radical call of discipleship that Jesus modeled by his own actions, by his own words. That's why he came to show us in the flesh what an authentically faithful, God-honoring life looks like like. And it looks radical. Other passages from the Sermon on the Mount that are essential components of building on the rock come from chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Starting with chapter 5, it reads this way from the message. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. Isn't that beautiful? You're here to be the light, bringing out the God colors in the world. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. And then chapter 6, be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you will not be applauding. You've seen them in action, I'm sure, play actors, I call them, treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it. Quiet and unobtrusively. These passages bring to mind the words openness and credibility as descriptors of an authentically faithful, God-honoring life. Although we know that it's important to invite others into the house of faith, sometimes we're reluctant because we're not even sure if we belong here ourselves. We worry because of our own mess-ups. Who are we to host another? I read a funny story that shines a light on this reality. It begins with a man who, has, who decides to stop at a stoplight. The light had turned yellow, and the driver behind him assumed that he was going to go through it. But he instead stopped, and so that made the woman who was behind him stopped very suddenly, and she was mad. She was so mad that she started yelling and shaking her fist and just basically having a fit until she looked up out of the driver's side window and saw a very serious face of a police officer. And the police officer asked her to step out of the car, and he actually took her down to the police station and took her picture and fingerprinted her and put her in a cell. And then about two hours later, the officer came back, 
And he was waiting there with her personal things, and he said, I do apologize for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and flipping the guy off in front of you and cussing a blue streak, and I noticed the what would Jesus do sticker and the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker and the little chrome fish on the back of your car, and I just assumed that that car was stolen. I have a feeling that we have had at least some of those thoughts, whether we were in the parking lot that is called Archer Road, or maybe even on 8th Avenue occasionally, other places in Gainesville. But you know what the good news is for us today as imperfect people, that God's grace is sufficient. Even when we don't get it right. What God really wants for us is to have a spirit that is open to his love because when we are open and we receive that spirit, it's only then that we are able to give it away. It is then that our faith in Jesus Christ becomes more and more credible in the eyes of God and in the eyes of other people. Not because we've made a show of it, but because what we do begins to come more and more out of who we are. What we do comes more and more authentically out of who we are. So an authentically faithful, God-honoring life is radical and open and credible. And the word that I've chosen for the final letter is kindness. This connects with the words found in chapter 7, verse 12. Here is a simple rule of thumb, a guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Think about what you would like people to do for you and then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets and this is what you get. One of my favorite songs, and I date myself because it came out in the late 90s, I believe, maybe early 2000s, but it is by Jewel, the artist Jewel, and the song is called Hands. And the lyrics, they're about being there for people in need, offering a helping hand, speaking up for those who don't have a voice. She sings this, I will get down on my knees and I will pray We are God's hands. We are God's mind. We are God's hands. And in the end, only kindness matters. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. In the coming days and weeks and months and years as we Continue to celebrate and build on our strengths as a faith family. Let us not forget the strong foundation that Jesus himself gives us with these words that we have explored today, words that call us to build our spiritual dwelling place on the rock without fear of being labeled radical, with an openness and a credibility that draws other people into God's amazing grace and with a kindness that is contagious and that makes this world a better place. These are the things that make up the rock on which the rain can pour, The river can flood and the tornado can hit, but nothing can move the sacred spaces of our heart, mind, and soul that are fixed upon it. 
Thanks be to God. Amen.